Welcome to another episode of the Beck Lover Podcast, where you might learn a thing or two about life. Today, I got a real treat for you. I have a new friend of mine, Chanel Omari. She's an American actress, stand-up comedian, writer, producer, host of the pop culture podcast, Chanel in the City, where she's had several very prominent people on, such as Kevin Bacon, Cedric the Entertainer, George Lopez, Barbara Walters. The list goes on. She's very... Uh, out there in the world doing her thing most people know her also for her stand-up and there's a lot going on right now in the Middle East she comes from a very diverse background which kind of encompasses both the Arabic perspective and the Jewish Israeli perspective uh, she is an American she is a New Yorker and I'm very happy to have you on Chanel so thank you for coming in here and um, rocking out with me Thank you so much, Beck. You have no, this is an honor. This is a true honor that you've had me on your podcast. I love your podcast. I've seen your clips. They're viral. You've touched and inspired a lot of us. So I want to say first and foremost, for a man like you to like women in general. Wow. Wow. <laughs> the most compliments I ever got from a man who's not scared to be a man. You know? I saw uh, we have a few friends uh, in common and my late brother, Garvis is so Nikki Knuckles was friends with, I, I see you in some pictures with uh, Danny A, the nightlife legend of New York city. Yeah. Amazing actor. Also. I love some of the stuff he's been in and producer. I don't think he would remember me cause I've gained about 110 pounds since he might've met me about 17 years ago, but you'd he, be surprised. He remembers every, I love him so much because he remembers everyone also, but I was probably in the same room as him a million times going to, Sweet 16s on a Tuesday night and Bungalow 8 and Lot 61. These are the old yep. classic lounges when lounges were a thing more than uh, massive festivals are today. And, um, you know, he's a staple of New York City nightlife community and hospitality. So shout out to Danny A. Hope you remember me. If not, it's time you remember me again. Shout out to Danny A. I love Danny A. You know, he just came out with a movie, he was just on the podcast on Chanel in the City, and the ironic part is he came out with a movie called The Engineer, which talks about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict that happened for decades and centuries, but in the 1990s specifically, how another terrorist organization like Hamas, extremists, you know, would take their own, you know, their own people and strap them with bombs and the engineer you know would come up with these bombs and pay for these bombs to kill like jewish people and israelis but also other arabs that were living in israel with jewish jewish people and israelis in peace emil hirsch is in it you should watch the movie it gives you some background education further that uh the middle east has been experiencing this with extreme organizations and terrorist groups for forever you know but he's amazing he's always he's always brought me under his wing he's always believed in me he's such an incredible human being in entertainment but also in life and i think these are the kind of examples we want to we should also look up to and look after the genuine people that like i say the people that are funny and genuine off on stage as much as off stage you know what i mean because you could get an actor and you can get a celebrity or a comic that's amazing at what they do so talented and then you meet them off stage and you're like am i talking to the right person is this you know, they're so phenomenal, but he is amazing and genuine with everything. And so, and he's super smart, super intelligent, and it's an amazing movie. And yeah, he's a, he's been really incredible to me. So shout out to him. Thank it's you like, for bringing it up. It's like when they say, uh, you know, don't meet your heroes. I, I've met many people that, you know, celebrities throughout my life and prom and I, I agree with, you know, sometimes you're like, I wish I never met them, you know, but it is what it is, you know. Some he's a man that I want you to meet in person because you would love him. And I feel like everyone should have the privilege and and access to help to to meet him because he is he's amazing he's an amazing role model too because he is the same person he is genuinely you know he's in a, he's a great person. Listen, Nothing my brother hung out with him all the time. I remember him from the nightlife. I already know he's an awesome dude, very talented. I've seen a lot of his work out there, and I would love to get back into his circle. Not that I was ever really in it, but I was. De facto, through my brother and his partner, Mo, and 
all the promoters of New York Nightlife and Tao right. Group and, you know, Marquee, you know, the original Marquee, which I missed, which was like, right. you couldn't even get in that bastard. You know, like it was so you hard. You couldn't to, even get in. Yeah. When yeah. you got in, you felt like you were on top of the world. Well, that was yeah. like one of my first big uh, Israeli friends was Raz, the door guy. Love Roz. Yeah, he's my man. He's and my homie. Roz is actually good friends with my cousin. And they live in the same town. And, you know, he's still doing his thing at Tuesday Baby Tuesday at Nebula. Yeah. Shout out to Richie Romero and that family. So, like I said, I've been in nightlife most of my life, mostly as a participant. Yeah, same. No, I, I've, I've been, I worked because my cousin who was best friends with Danny A. Um, shout out to Danny Omari, who I love. And, you know, my father's brother's son. He uh, created... Uh, it was called Upstairs with Danny A. It was one of the most exclusive nightclubs in the world. It was like a one oak. And only celebrities like Denzel Washington, Paris Hilton, I mean, the A-listers, you know, Julia Roberts, even people you would never think would party, would go, they would party. Let their hair down. Yeah, let their hair down and nobody would know about it. And Danny A and Danny Omari, they both did the, the club together. So I was a young, you know, I was always looking up to them and I was like, this is so cool. And, you know, as a woman, you're as a woman who barely has rights in a Middle Eastern family <laughs> and everyone's like, make babies, shut up. You don't know what you're saying. Those two men were like the example of what men should be like. And they took me under their wing and I worked for them and I was a hostess and I was a waitress and I kind of worked my way from the bottom up. And it's so funny that you can relate to nightlife because a lot of comedians can't. They, they're like, what? What's, what? what's so cool about this hospitality life? What's so cool about this, like, you know, this nightlife? And I think I think it's a, a part of it why they don't get in, they don't want to get in, is because not everybody can get in unless you have access, unless you have resources. So I learned from a younger age, like, yeah, it's you have to be a great person, you have to be kind. But I learned the business from them, like looking up to them, you know, and then really, you know. You got to be a really good networker to get what we call yes. juice. Juice means juice, the ability right. to pretty much just walk into juice. any venue on any night doesn't matter if the biggest celebrities Literally. on earth are on there because you're what we would call a local celebrity like a, a new york socialite is basically the term that i would classify you me him you know yep. certain degrees obviously some people are higher and it's like a royalty basically new york yeah, family. Like because of because of danny a honestly i don't have a i can get in any club at tau group also that's why chanel in the city was born because it was like everyone wanted to live vicariously through this girl who got in you know, I can go to Little Sister and Wass opens up the door for me and I go right in and there's a bunch of models and actors waiting online. They're like, who is this girl? Or Roz is at Nebula, at, which is very hard to get into. You know, Danny A with Tao and Noah Teppenberg. And so I've partied and I've worked for all these people since I was a kid. And that's the juice. You're right. You kind of like, everybody kind of works to that success, to have that lifestyle, to have that kind of juice, you know, that power. You know what the irony is for me? Hmm. after reaching the highest level of nightlife where you have that type of juice and i don't even drink anymore i spent millions of dollars on bottles and thank god they were cheaper <laughs> back in the day and they weren't going as crazy with these parades and all that stuff in the old yeah. days they, there wasn't even a sparkler when they brought the bottle out they just brought the bottle to your table and drink but a bottle was 200 bucks back then 250 so the irony now is i don't even drink i haven't drank in over a decade well, that's so amazing. it's all free i can get anything i want comped and i don't even drink it's the irony of life. Isn't that the irony? I know that's so true. So let's kind of, before we get into it, and we kind of got into a little bit of the heavy subject because it's weighing on all of our hearts, mm -hmm. what's going on in Israel and Gaza and the conflict that seems to never, never going to stop. Unfortunately, it just doesn't look like it's stopping anytime soon. I always like to give my guests a little bit, you know, I told them, you know, what you do in your life, but let's kind of start from like your roots. So Tell me a little bit about your life. What's your background? Where did your life start? You know, and kind of how did you end up working in entertainment? And I mean, you kind of told us a little bit about that, but fill in some of the gaps. I love that. Great questions, by the way. Fantastic questions. Um, no one's ever asked me that before, so thank you. That's important to me. I grew up, so I look white, right? I look like this typical white girl, but I'm not. I grew up as... Um, I would think you're it, Italian if I didn't know you. A lot of people say that, or Greek. Or even Albanian. Or even Albanian. I've got an Albanian before. Mediterranean-ish. Mediterranean, which I am. Um, I grew up as an Israeli, Iraqi, Colombian, Jewish-American girl, woman. And why I say all those 
roots is because my father was born in Israel, but his parents are from Iraq. And like now we're talking about this whole Israeli-Palestinian conflict where, and there's so much to get into, but a lot of the facts is a lot of Jews were kicked out like Albanians. We've talked about this, like a lot of minorities, minorities, but we were kicked out of a lot of places. So a lot of people are like, wait a minute, you're Jewish and Israeli. How are you Iraqi? Well, my grandparents were living in Iraq. Then they moved because of, you know, what was going on with Jewish people in Iraqis. So they and were Iraqi Jews. They were Iraqi Jews. And then they moved to Israel. And that's where my father, he was he was born to them with uh, five other kids. So he's one out of six. And I, you know, he met my mom. My mom's a Colombian Jew. She was from, she was born in Cali, Colombia. She moved to Israel with my father. You know, then they moved to the States together. They're both immigrants working you know, working immigrant parents, my father drove a taxi, my mom was working at, you know, and then finally my mom was working at his shoe store when they had met. So I, I was born to this family where they wanted the American dream, they wanted better for us, but they also raised us as, you know, Israeli, Arab, and Jewish. You know, Jewish is the religion, Jewish was our, you know, our tradition. Um, And it was hard for me, it was hard for me because I experienced a lot of anti- even though they wanted to shelter me, they put me in Jewish schools. They wanted me to grow up with a lot of Jewish kids. I never understood why they were so adamant about it. And, you know, you hear the stories of the Holocaust and you hear the stories of what's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or terrorism and how everybody wants to kill the Jews or or the terrorists want to kill the Jews, really. Um, and it was hard for me. It was hard for me to, to just admit who I was, what I just said to you right now. It was. It was easier for me to say I'm American, I'm white. I, I'm, I'm whatever you want me to be. I'm Italian. I'm this because I was so scared of being who I was. I was so scared of saying those things I just told you right now. What if people don't like me? What if I'm not good enough? You know, all the trauma was coming. They say it's generational trauma. So, yeah, that's. Um, and so I you feel like they tried to keep you in the community to kind of shelter you. Maybe is that yeah? Or, and and hopefully, Albanians also do this where. <clears throat> maybe it's it's now eased a lot actually but culturally we were very ethnocentric i guess not ethnocentric but like in a yeah. sense where <clears throat> we didn't care what you married if it wasn't albanian it, it was no good meaning right. we were trying to because when you are when you do come from an oppressed people mm -hmm. there's that mentality of we need to survive another generation and because you're living amongst the diaspora you're living in so many foreign lands and different countries. And that's another similarity that Albanians have with the Jewish community. We're all over the world. Literally half of our population, because of war and poverty, were forced to live in other communities and other countries. So there was always this try to keep us together, try to arrange marriages so they could survive another generation in the diaspora. Right. And it's not that... You don't want to, because I, I am, I'm actually alive today because my uncle married a Jewish woman. If it wasn't for her, I would not be here today. So to be against marrying out, and I was for a very long time because I grew up in a culture of my people were at war. I lost 30 people in my family in a single day. So I grew up in a very nationalistic environment during the late 80s up until the year 2000 because the war broke out in Kosovo and I lost 30 people in one day. So mm -hmm. there was that silent pressure to marry within the community preserve another generation it had nothing to do with anybody's below my people or not good enough for my people but it was we want to survive one more generation yes if we all if half of our people live in the melting pots that means in 50 years we just lost half of our population that's worse than a massacre that's worse than a, it's, it's a genocide through it's a financial genocide is what it is your right. people get wiped out because they have to go live abroad and that's the problem when there's a conflict in your homeland, which affects, you know, everybody. So Everyone. I don't know if and that makes any thing. sense to you, but. No, it makes, I couldn't say it better myself. Honestly, you articulated for me because it's so emotional. Like I was raised thinking, you know, with the Jewish people, we were, it was so tight knit. You know, we went to Jewish schools. They wanted us to be raised with, you know, yeshiva and right, like only marry within. And I, I, I know that a lot of people think that is because we thought we were better and it's never the case. It's never, if you understand the history and especially now, I always experienced anti-Semitism, especially in entertainment, more than a lot of my Jewish peers or friends. Until now, they're like, Chanel, wow. Now I get it. Like now from a fight, from a war that's in the Middle East, 
now spreading more anti-Semitism because, you know, we'll get into that in America, in the world. Now I understand your fears and your parents' fears and why they wanted to keep you close-knit and why you want they wanted you to only be with Je Jewish people. Like you said, the next generation, they were scared that we weren't going to have more Jewish people, you know, that, you know, we're already 0.2% of the world. So not even it, that, that might be the same boat. There's only 13 million of us, you know, which is insane that people would want to kill both of us off from the human race, because how can little people like that little bit of a culture set people off? And I don't, and to me, I just feel like it has to be, it's not just about land. It's not just about war. It's more about like, if you have two brothers or two sisters or cousins and one is jealous of the other and they keep saying this person, you know, she did this and he did this and two wrongs don't make a right. It's really about figuring out what's going to make these two people happy and how can we live in peace because war will always be a part of it, you know, or, or extremists or radicalists. To me, I think it's about Hamas. I think if Israel and the Palestinians want to live at peace, they want to, any Arabs want to live at peace with Israel. We've have done that for years. And I think it's the extremist groups, the terrorist groups like Hamas, who don't give their own people or us the the privilege or the freedom. Do you do not it. think, you know? do you think that they're, cannot be any extremist on the Israeli side. I mean, you had Yitzhak Rabin, who was assassinated. He brought the two people the closest to peace they ever had a chance, right? We have a street yeah. named after him in New York City, and that assassination made me very sad. So could there not also be extremists on the Israeli side also? I'm not saying the whole population, but I think there's extremists in every group. There of, could. There of could every be people. But but well, the thing with Israel and war and Jewish people, we've been raised, you know, the difference is, so we've been raised to not lead with terror or not um, rape or murder. There's difference, you know, because like, and, and I'm saying this also for the Palestinian people, there, a lot of their, them are innocent. A lot of Arabs and Muslims are innocent civilians and casualties because of these terrorist groups that think that the world will be better because they don't, they don't care about their lives like we do because they say that when they're getting trained we our life is to allah right to god to their god to they they think another, that's another video that i went viral for by the way that you right i saw that and and it's like but that's not what muslims it's teach. the same word in all three languages allah elohim ilah right is the right. is the cognate of the word allah right which is not a name in that aspect it means the god it's the right. same. It's the same word in all three languages, including the language of Christ, which is Aramaic. So right. when we say that these people are cousins through faith, they literally have the same word for God. The issue that I notice as an outsider, and we got to remember, you know, there's going to be a little bias if you're of Jewish descent more towards your and people, course. and if you, I mean, if we're, we're going to be real here and have a real conversation, um, there's people that. Look at the situation depending where you start the history, right? Some people want right. to go back as far as the Bible 5,000 years ago. Some people want to go back to 1947. Is Eight. that when it yeah. was? You know, 1948 or 47, I believe, yeah. Right, right after World War II. Some want to look just what happened on October 7th. So what do you say to people who do not agree with maybe, I, you know, I condemn what happened on October 7th. As someone that lost his family, I never once felt enough hatred in my heart to be happy that, and it took me, and, and if I'm going to sit here and act like I did not have hatred in my heart during the Kosovo conflict, when I lost 30 people in my family overnight, the youngest member was five years old, killed by soldiers from that regime, from that government. The mistake I made as a young man was putting everybody in one box. That I had a blind hatred at one point in my life because I just experienced trauma. Right. The type of trauma that's going on right now. If right. you're an Israeli who had your family member kidnapped. If you're a Palestinian person who had a bomb dropped that killed your family, unfortunately, because they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. You're going to have that rage because I experienced it myself. When I got the phone call and found out that my cousin was only one, and I didn't know right away that he survived either. My first cousin survived the massacre of our family. I didn't know for about four days later that he actually, his survival story is insane. Wounded with like 30 bullets and no medical attention on the side of a mountain, using his hands in and out of contact. Like he should not be alive today. 
Right. The way he survived is a miracle. Literally had to come down a mountainside on his hands while he's wounded. Like, it's it's insane. That's why I believe, like, unless it's your time, nothing can kill you. Wow, and, that's uh, really powerful. That's really powerful. Well, I think 9-11 is the greatest example of that for all of us because, you know, I was there that day, too. I was underneath the World Trade Center. When it got hit, I was on the E-train. I was probably on the last E-train that ever went into the World Trade Center. I went to Pace University. There was people that called out sick because they were at last 61 the night before, right? Right. On a Monday night, which was industry right. nights. So, like, that little decision, you didn't think about it, to me, was destiny because I believe the game board of life is rigged. But we have free will, how we respond. So when my family died, my first response was to be full of hatred. And it was. I was full of hatred towards that group of people. I didn't want to know a Serbian. I didn't want to even think of being friends with one. I felt like if I even spoke to one, I was betraying my people. Right. Okay? And there's definitely some of that between your two people. 100%. 100%. 100%. So for me, the beauty of living in New York City is that you're forced as an American, leaving where our families come from behind, we are forced to deal with all walks of life, which is what to me has given New York the most beautiful story of all time because it brings people from all over the world where they have no choice but to interact and to learn how to coexist. And this is to me what made America an amazing place throughout history. And it's only in this politically charged climate over the last six, seven years that it feels like I don't recognize my city anymore. Right. It's kind of lost its spirit a little bit. And besides being closed and all that stuff that happened, but to not lose the essence of what I'm trying to say is I was full of so much hatred that I refused to even want to make a friend from that side. And sorry about that. And it was only once I had a group of friends who took me to a bar and the owner was Serbian. And, you know, I went there 20 times, not even hi to the guy. He was so friendly to me. And then eventually I think he figured it out. He's like, this guy probably doesn't like me because I'm Serbian. Like he won't even like he sees me talking to everyone else, but I never spoke to him. And it wasn't because I hated him as a as a person, but again, because he's Serbian, my family got killed. It seems like they all agree with what happened. So they're all guilty. And I don't want to know you. And I don't ever want to be close to you. And I'll never trust you. And I'll you know so it was only through him, and his name was Andreas. I don't, I've lost touch with him, and if you've seen this, shout out to Andreas for for showing me why it's dangerous to put everyone into one box. And it's happening to the to the Jewish community right now. It's happening to the Muslims after 9-11. And I learned from my own experience that you can't paint everybody with the same brush and you can't put everyone into the box and not everyone agrees with what their government does or, right. and a lot of times we're in America because we don't agree with what our homelands do or whatever the case may be. And again, I'm talking from my own personal experience, not yours. And I did become friends with this man and he spoke to me and he said, you know, what happened was excessive and this and that, and I didn't agree with it. And that's why I left the country. I know what my people did to your people. He acknowledged that pain and we became friends, and it helped me evolve. As well, that's what, I think we, that's what I think we need, is that we need to take each other as brothers and sisters. You're right. I also got put, by the way, I'm not an angel. After what happened recently, I'm, I was the most loving, open-minded person you'll ever meet. Loving, wanting to love, wanting to tell my family, no, you don't understand. We, you don't get it. It's progressed. People are different. And now I'm realizing what they were trying to keep me protected from was that it's good versus evil. It's not about Israelis versus Palestinians, uh, Jews versus Muslims. To me, I think it's, I guess for me, it's clear as day is it's us as human beings versus terrorism. People that are extremists that want to tell you that's the religion we believe in, but we want to take over the world. First, we want to kill off the Jews, but then we want to take over the world with violence and rape. That's not a world that I signed up for you or any of us signed up for, like you said. And by the way, with Israel, when you said, you know, they, th you know, what do we do about the casualties of the Palestinians? Israel is very, has to, they have to um, ab abide by war rules with America and the UN and everything. They have made, they have given um, warnings to the Palestinian people, to the innocent civilians. 
this is what we have to do to get rid of all the Hamas. And the Hamas tells them they have to stay there. It's a catch-22. So we don't know these things going behind the scenes. My opinion is that Palestinians are frustrated with their government, but they're too scared of their government. So they're going to have to go with what is th what their government's doing. It's like their government's putting them as casualties, where Israelis try very hard not to put their own people or Palestinian people in harm's way. But it's a catch-22. What are we supposed to do? Er erase ourselves? You know what I mean? So... I'm going to play devil's advocate a little bit. Yes, I don't yes. Have, please, I, don't, I want to know your opinion. I, I, don't, I, want to know your I opinion. don't have a Palestinian to <laughs> Excuse me. counter, and I, I want to be as fair as possible. Wait, and by the way, I want to hear from the Palestinians that are actually living in Gaza. Not the Palestinian Americans, with all due respect, like me, who have had privilege here, don't have their facts straight, and need to go to their ancestors and talk to them and have conversations with people like you, with people like me, with other Arab countries. So what do you say to, they wanna, you know, to, they to people say, like us who maybe don't understand everything? Okay. We see the images. There is a shitload of civilians dead on their side. We know what happened on October 7th. Disgusting, unexcusable, regardless, even if you're being... So I'll take my perspective. In our war for, for liberation from the former Yugoslavia, which, by the way, was the last thing that we did... We did civil, it's all documented. We did civil disobedience for over two decades. We were being beaten, killed, everything, thrown into jail, checkpoints. We were on the occupation in Kosovo. And then the world left us out of the Dayton Accords in Ohio when the Bosnian War. So the Bosnian War was raging. You know, f over half a million people died there. The worst atrocities since World War II were committed in Bosnia, not even against my people, against the Bosnians. You had just the Srebrenica massacre was 8,000 unarmed men and boys in a United Nations safe zone. This is all on YouTube. Pull it up. You can see the Serbian general, Radic, walk in, Mladic, tells them, it's just on camera, no one can say, Allah can't save you, but I can. And then within a, less than a week and a half, he massacred all 8,000 of them, very well documented. They had the peacekeepers held hostage from the United Nations. So... These types of things have happened. And to me, to be honest with you, that, that expression never again, for me, it feels like a lie because it's happened so many times since World War II, not only in Europe. We right. forget places like Rwanda, Yemen. And I will agree that <clears throat> there is some hypocrisy that I was, you know, I'm vocal for those that follow me. My followers know I've spoken about everything going on. I was vocal about Yemen. Mm -hmm. I was vocal about Syria. <clears throat> I was against the Iraq war. I didn't like Saddam Hussein, but I didn't, I don't want my country in every, every war. It's like all we've known. And we'll, we'll get back to the whole Israel Palestine thing. So I do feel there is some hypocrisy that, you know, it seems like everyone's coming out of the woodworks, right? right. For this issue. But what about the 24 million that were almost starving to death? under the Yemeni Saudi Arabian conflict? What about the 2 million Uyghurs in China that are in constant, you guys are all wearing Nike still and rocking your iPhones with these parts that are made by human slaves. This is well documented. So I guess I'm not getting a sponsorship from China, but in any event, um, so I do feel that. So I, I really try to, put myself outside both without bias right the way i gathered it leaving the ancient claims because i feel in essence both have an ancient claim there if we look at old maps even right. from the king even from ancient. the kingdom of israel there was a, a below which is kind of weird because on that map it shows like where gaza is right now right. it's kind of like only where they were at that time we're talking about thousands of years ago it was the kingdom of Israel, and then, and I'll pop the map. Well, what's up. the problem of sharing? That's what we're all trying. And why rape and murder? So, and like, why deliberately? Is it to hurt us? Do you? I'm trying to understand here, it too. So, so this is kind of where I'm at. I feel like yeah. what happened to the Jews throughout Europe, World War II, was horrific. And anyone that denies the Holocaust is out of their mind. Thank you for saying that, because they are. No, doing because it. I can tell you, regardless of what happened to the Jewish people. My grandmother's two brothers were hung off trees by the SS. 16 and 18 years old in northern Albania. They told them they're going to take them to work in camps. They literally took them down the road and hung, hung them off trees. My, my poor grandmother lost her two older brothers in World War II. 
Right. I was going to say that's what I was going to say that the point is it affected everyone. So Albania it was other people. Yeah, Albania was under Italian fascists first, then Mussolini got overthrown, then the German Nazis moved in. They wanted list. The Albanians said, "Fuck you. There's only Albanians here." A predominantly Muslim country. Mm -hmm. Which shows again why these stereotypes need to be broken. Yes. And if we look at history traditionally compared to everywhere else the Jews lived when they were on Muslim lands, they, uh, they left Europe during the Inquisition because they went to the Muslim. I mean, this, these are facts of history. Like what was going right, on? You need, they, to know history. you need to know history to know this. The Inquisition was horrific. What uh, Some would say it was even worse than the Holocaust in, in terms of the amount of people that were alive in the world for the Jewish population. I mean, they were torturing and killing people who weren't even Jewish just to make them say, you are Jewish, and then fucking kill them during the Inquisition. I mean, it was the Spanish Inquisition. It was fucking crazy, right? What's sad is I feel like over the years, especially this last hundred years, is the stories of the coexistence of Arabs and Jews and Muslims and Jews has been lost. And I think there's a couple reasons for that too. But for me, just kind of on the outside trying to be fair, and I know neither side's going to be happy with my analysis, I think that what happened to the Jews was horrific. They had nowhere to go. Nobody wanted them. The British had control. The British helped them set up their state, period. Mm -hmm. Arabs were pushed out. It's undeniable. It happened. The, the population that was there. You get to a point where there is no winning there. I wish there would be a way that they would have coexisted. I just think that the UN at that point should have made two states from the beginning right. or said no. It's not going to be just a Jewish state because that's what it was called even from that time. To, to protect us, right. Yeah, so again, I blame the British more than anybody during that time period. I'm not saying British people today. I'm saying British during that time could have set this up maybe better, fairer. There was violence that went back and forth. I understand that too. And the six-day, I, I understand all of that. And I know we're also past the point because there's people that say they wanted to go back before World War II and... That's not a solution either, in my opinion. And the problem is with all this violence, can there ever be a healing moment? And I think a lot of people, what they want to, how they want to attack Israel and the Jews is, well, they say, well, you guys came there and you pushed everyone. And that's their argument. Right. And then they're also then calling for the elimination of the state completely. Do they have an ancestral claim to the land? Absolutely. It's undeniable from that long. Some would say, well, time expired. So I'm not really making a statement, but how do you address that? Or what do you say? Like, how do you, what do you think is the right way for people to view the whole conflict in a nutshell, which is to me, there is no right. nutshell with this conflict. No, there is no not nutshell. First, first of all, it's conversations eh, like this. Thank you for having the conversation because it's conversations like this that have to happen that we can't be scared of. And, talking about it with people that are smart, that have education, that have knowledge, that have history, that I'm learning from too, by the way, because I'm not an expert. I'm not a miss know it all. I'm learning too. Here's my thing though. You have kids. I don't. And I always try to understand what the kids stuff. My mom tried to explain this to me. And I know this is on a, a minor scale, but bear with me. You have two kids and they're fighting. One of the kids, he said, dad, I came home and I, and I caught the fish. I caught the fish. It's my fish. And I got it and I earned it and it's mine. He said, okay, I'm proud of you. And then the, your your younger son, you know, for some reason, your older son didn't take care of the fish and it was going to go get spoiled or whatnot. And then your younger son goes, but dad, I also have a right to share the fish. Can I share the fish? Now, as a parent, I don't know, I was raised like this. Maybe this was the wrong way to get raised, but is to share. So my whole thing is like, I can't even understand this concept because if I understood the Jewish people's history and the Arab people's history, I would say, listen, I get it. Israel was yours first, but they need a state. They have nowhere to go. They're getting executed all over the place. They're getting shunned all over. We at least have our brothers, our Muslim, our brothers that we can, you know, you know, had other countries like Egypt and, and Lebanon and, and to share. So to me, I'm like, A, why didn't the UN help for two states that could have solved the situation? But my question is, if they would have gone Israel, if the Jews were not in Israel right now, would they still be happy? Because what we're seeing in the world, it doesn't seem to me that they will unless they take over the world. And that can't happen. It's that's not going to happen. It's like uh, people standing up and saying to Nazi Germany, now we're going to get involved. Because this, we don't, yeah, the Jewish people are our allies right now, but we have to get involved for the bigger picture because then we're going to, if we leave it up to you guys, you're going to take over the world with this violence, with this 
you know, Nazism, with this radicalism, you know, all I, I just don't believe in extreme radicalism with anything. And it's hard for me because I'm I I was raised loving my Arab brothers just as much as I should love my Israeli brothers, you know, and we were living in peace for a long time. I mean, Palestinians, we're the only ones who are not allowed in Gaza as Jews, but Palestinians are allowed to come to Israel, work there, live there. You know, I feel like a lot of times, you know, if we don't come together and really address the situation of the terrorist groups, of, this is not okay, we can't live like this, then we're always going to have war. It's what do you, always but then what do you say about like those maps? Like if you but, don't discipline your older son, he's always going to say, well, dad, F you, I'm going to do what I want. If you don't then what do in. you say like when they show the picture of like where they were living and then it's, I think it's like white and green and then it shows it shrinking. Then they just end up in the West Bank and Gaza. Like, remember, talking to me like I'm an outsider because... Right, technically right, I am right. yeah like people find it hard they feel like they were pushed out completely and then put into these two areas some call it open air prison how do you like is, what is fair or what like I don't I don't think there's any going back that's there's no going back for either side some would say maybe what's going on is excessive the response. I understand what happened to, to the Israelis. Kidnapping, murder. I saw the one video where the guy got hit with a rocket. And it was, it was fucking, imagine you're driving to work and someone hits you with a rocket. It's fucking insane. And by the way, there's a lot of videos they won't share because of the graphicness. So that's why people are denying it. Like and, the, you know, the Holocaust. And you use the analogy of two children. Mm -hmm. My analogy, if I'm being 100% speaking from my heart, as someone that's lost family and I think nobody wins in war, from the person that has to pull the trigger to the person that's on the other side of it, both ways. That I agree. Because we're all going to have to answer to God, in my opinion. We're all going to answer to God. And I don't believe that there's collateral damage with God. I do believe there's an intention. If your intention was, like, God knows what your intention is. So right. We you can all, not, right. You can't lie. Yeah, we yet. can all sit here and say, right. <laughs> you know, um, I tried not to. God's going to know if you tried not to or did. And I believe if you really didn't and, it, like, you know, it's, it's a war that happens, I believe God can forgive that. But if you knew that's going to inflict serious damage on innocent life, and you knew, I think that's different when, you, when we're talking to God. I don't think there is collateral damage with God, in my opinion. And we all claim to believe in God, and blah, blah. meanwhile, we all, we're all just making atheists happy right now, is what we're right. doing. They're like, you see these fucking assholes? Like, you know, there's so much in common, and look at what they're doing to each other. But my true opinion is, I do feel it has been maybe a little excessive, at least the numbers are, whether it was their intentions or not. And I feel like that's why there's more of an outcry this time. Not that they didn't have a right to defend or go after the people that did this or try to get their hostages out. Certain places get hit. And I know that they say, well, Hamas uses them as shields. And then people like to use that analogy. Well, if you're in a bank and they're holding you hostage, you're going to blow up the whole bank. So it's like, how do you like, what the hell do you say to people? It's tough. You, you you know, I there's a lot of good points. Here's also another thing. It took the Israeli government a month, a little bit over, to calculate even the amount of deaths, which was 1,400 people, right? Like accurately documented. On the everything. Israeli side. On the Israeli side. The problem I have with Hamas is Hamas always, they it's like an abusive relationship. It's like a boyfriend who gaslights you who's a narcissist. That never happened. It, it, it goes from 2,000 to 8,000 in a day. Like, let's at least be fair and real, you know, if there were, if there are, which I know there are casualties on the other end, that's not even, that's not an argument. There's going to be casualties on both ends. Like you said, war. I don't like war. I'm a peaceful person. I'm a comic. I like to come from love. My family raised me from love, but we both people have been oppressed. Both people have the generational tra trauma and the anxiety. And to me, I'm not, I'm not understanding how can we can't come together to figure out, even though it's complicated, can't we sacrifice a little bit from each other? Can't Isn't it about giving a little bit? Now, Israelis, we feel we give. We gave. I mean, it's not really... Israel's not just a Jewish people's you know, country. Christians and Catholics and Muslims, they live there and they live in peace. And Israel is there to protect them too, by the way, on top of the Jewish people and Israeli people. They're there to protect Palestinians that are innocent. But they're not there to encourage... Um, terrorism, like Hamas, extreme organizations, to get away with what they want to get away with, you know, it's like telling your son, you know, yeah, you can put the whole bank on fire, you're, you, you, but we're going to give you your iPhone tomorrow. It's all good. You know, there has to be some consequences, some discipline, and I think the world gets mad at Israel 
because we are a strong army and it is, we are strong. We, when we, we've been kind and we do give and we do share and we do give, you know, we come 50, 50 and then they want everything. So how do we protect ourselves when Hamas's agenda says, kill all the Jews, kill Israel. It's like, imagine someone came to you and said that to you. It's like you either, I, I don't know how you can come from, come back from that. How do you, how do you propose a tre uh, peace treaty? We've asked them, we've, we've, proposed two state solutions we propose and ask them what can we do to make this a better you know a better uh living situation and it's like it's it just seems like nothing's enough so it feels to me like it's a lot of manipulation a lot of violent um it's like a violent agenda i can't even articulate it like the way i want to without being biased because i don't want people to think this is like now of course i'm gonna i'm gonna have to activate and for my people because since the holocaust we always said if we don't talk if we don't speak up that's how we lose a lot of Jewish lives. That's how we let anti-Semitism live. That's how we let Hamas convince the world that, yes, blame the Jews. I mean, where's their accountability at all? I mean, you better believe if I raped and murdered someone, the fingers would be pointed at me and I'd have to somehow, whether I'm denying it or not, take accountability. So I guess why is it always like, you know, taking the, taking, it's always taking the Palestinian side and their victimizing them and taking their feelings into consideration but enough has to be enough at some point when is everybody going to take accountability so only israel we shouldn't feel bad for israel for getting a massacre of 1400 people we shouldn't feel bad for the anti-semitism spreading kill the jews in the whole world but if we did this to black people if we did this to other arabs if we did this to asians it wouldn't be such a pretty tune that we'd be singing now would it be but jews allow a lot of shit to happen because we've been trained to shut our mouths to live quietly to you know Another war can happen. So this, now, listen, I'm not the expert. I'm not Miss Know-It-All. There's a lot I have to learn too. I want to be, you know, I want to learn history. I want to educate myself. But I do feel like a lot of these Palestinian Americans, when they're saying from the river to the sea and they're chanting to kill off Israel, so so that's okay. But yeah, we have to support that. I mean, who in their right mind and is, is that? Is, what it's that bullshit. is that what it means? 100 yes, percent like to wipe israel off agenda. the map and they don't get to wipe jewish people and israel off the map and they want it all so fine if they get it all let's say we give it to them all now they're going to come into america do it with america they took off already the american flag so what are we seeing here we're seeing a yes people who have been oppressed so have we so have you we've all been oppressed so have black people so have asian people when are we all going to as minorities get together and say okay enough is enough we don't have to be greedy. You have this part, part, we'll have this part. We're okay here. How can I help you there? But to take over the world with this like poor me saga all the time and not feel bad for anybody else, how do they expect the world to even want to come to their aid? And I'm trying to understand that. You know, I'm trying to really understand, you know, how no one had a I heart. I think when, it, when the situation, you know. It's like we don't matter because we're Jewish. That's what I think. They're in there. I think that, saying. you know. That's why the government there really needed to be, I, in my opinion, extremely careful with their response to not lose the public support. And I feel like they might have dropped the ball a little bit. You know, but we live in a. How would they act? How do you act? That's the thing. So I'm not a leader of war. I don't think I would ever be able. I'm not to. a general either. I don't know. I don't know if you send in special forces. But I guess you know what I would say. I think when it's all over, and I hope it ends soon. Me too. And. If they the, all these people get displaced, if they allow them to return at least to Gaza, then you can kind of say like you see we weren't so right now they you know they're claiming they're going to ethnically cleanse them, get them completely out of there, and take over Gaza. I got to tell you, if Israel does do that, I don't think the masses are going to forget that they promised not to do that. So I think you know I think what I'm saying is I think everyone's paying it's a attention. Fine line, no, you have you have a point. It's a what do you think we're all scared shitless to talk because we're, it's a fine line. Nothing we say is good enough. I've never seen this in my life that the whole world is just like nothing's good enough. But what there's but let me ask you a question: to take off kidnapped anyone who's kidnapped to t and I've been the one going out helping with the signs, posting them. Of course, according to law and legalities of not vandalism and all that, but. You're taking off kidnapped innocent people that are not only Jewish and Israeli, there are some Muslims, some Arabs that were kidnapped. And for the negotiations, Americans, people don't realize this. It's like you're taking this down. Where's the heart? Like, where's our country going? Where's our world going? I just thought we progressed and it just, it's clear. Sometimes it's, it gets. It yeah, I didn't clear. find any, any, any way you could justify that regardless. I mean, it's just to the point where 
they guess they don't even believe that that's real. You know that I think so, right, and that's what's hurtful, and that's what's heartbreaking. That like we have to accept and not deny the casualties that have been dead on their side, and we never deny that. And then we try to find solutions, and we try to say, hey, look, please, maybe it's a, a maybe it's the Palestinians and Israelis trying to convince Hamas or not. I, or I don't know, elect Hamas. See, I don't know how the government is. To there, me, it's even they- crazy that like they're two separate. First of all, I don't even know how the hell they would have two states if they keep the land they have now. I know there was UN resolutions that called for original borders, and many claim that that you know that failed, and then there was more settlements. I mean, these are things that did happen. So this is why it's hard for people to really that are outside to comment or to understand why, or just just so much from both sides, and so, so many, sides. yeah, and so many of us feel caught in the middle, and. It really, like, honestly, like, I didn't even, I didn't even, like, I make content, like, every day. And then since this started, you know, I, I've been having a very hard time doing anything because it just makes me really, I had to turn off the phone for a few days. Yeah, same. You know, and um, I just don't know. And what bothers me is that we're starting to see this spill into our streets. Right, right. And for the right. first time as a New Yorker, I'm like... I, I have, if you go listen to my podcast, I, and I, my, my most famous appearance was on the Concrete Podcast, now called the Danny Jones Podcast. And I spoke about uh, the episodes titled The Dark History of Albania and the Collapse of the American Empire. And I spoke about what I loved about being a New Yorker, that I was literally in a park and I see the Hasidim woman, you know, she's there with her kids and I see the Arabic woman, she's covered in hijab. They're next to each other, they're talking their kids yeah. are playing, and I said, if this was across the ocean, they'd be killing each other. And this is what made me happy. So to start seeing this type of stuff happen in America, in the streets of New York, is very disturbing to me. And it just shows how, for some reason, this place called Jerusalem has been a flashpoint throughout human history. And it resonates with the three Abrahamic faiths. Mm-hmm. but I don't find justification for any side to do what they're doing. If I'm, you know, for me, I just don't, I can't, like, we all believe in Moses. My son's name is Aaron, my firstborn. Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill. Now, do you have a right to defend yourself? Yes. Do you have a right to even revenge death against the combatant? Yes. My my line is always civilians. Always. So it's hard. People find it hard, I think, when they want to judge Israel, who has more technology and more weapons and whatever. So when they see it, they're like, well, you guys have more power. Maybe that's why you should have more responsibility and be more careful. And this is where they're drawing. The, this is kind of like the vibe that's out there. And I also think, by the way, on that note, I do. I, the reason why I have uh, empathy for the other side, for the Palestinians, is because I think they're very frustrated. It's kind of like when your mom tells you, you know, don't play with that kid, the neighbor. He's a bad influence. Meanwhile, your mom doesn't know. She's just protective and she's just watching out for you. I guess the analogy here is like they're going to listen to their government, Hamas, that they think is out for them or freedom fighters. But that's not freedom fighters. It's more control, money. You know, I think Palestinians are frustrated with Israelis because the Hamas is telling them, well, Israel's supposed to do this for us and Israel's supposed to do this for you. And it's like, but how much Israel doesn't have $11 billion like Hamas does. And Hamas should not be building tunnels to to escape because if you're going to kill, just be, just don't be a coward about it. Just own it. Be a gangster about it, you know? And I don't mean to like advocate that. I'm just saying, be a gangster. Don't be a coward. Don't build tunnels so no one can find you. You know, that, that makes no sense. And then also help your people. Help your people with water, with this, because you know that there's a war. You know there's negotiations. You're not stupid. You're going into it. And you're sitting on $11 billion. Of course your people are going to be frustrated and take it out on the wrong person because they don't know better. These people aren't as educated. They need education to understand. Wait a minute. Let's understand both ends so we can come together and fight this thing called, I think it's terrorism. I think it's extremists. I don't like what's happening in America. That's why we're all here. Like you said, it was supposed to be a free country where... You can have different opinions. You can have, but I've never seen it this bad. But we where, leave the beef over there. You know what I mean? Right. We can right. have our leave argument. The beef over, exactly. You know? But where but the beef is over there. Right. But like, 
I guess we saw we felt since beginning in history of time we're so dehumanized. It's like we're not human. Like even the Holocaust, it was a number. This woman who was a survivor, she's like, I was just a number. I wasn't even a human or a person. And that's what we're scared that would happen to us. And we're seeing it now that, you know, the Jews are to blame. The Jews aren't real. The Jews are the bad people. But so we're the only people of the whole race. So there's two wars we're fighting. There's a lot of things happening that stemming from this war where, so we're not a human race. We're not, we shouldn't, we don't have the right to exist. So that's our end of it, you know. It would have been beautiful if after World War II, they came in, you know, and somehow you guys all just would have had one fucking state, man. You know, not even two. Like, you know what? This happened to you guys. It's horrible. You're here now. Let's figure a way. But, you know, again, I blame the world. I blame the world government. I don't blame. I understand what the Jews went through. Right. I understand why the Palestinians are like, well, we didn't do that to you. So, you know, so it's like a really sticky situation. It's uncomfortable to talk about. Of course. It makes us sad. And I just don't understand. I understand the hostages are still in there. But there's got to be a way to bring this, hopefully, to a ceasefire. And then there really has to be a serious conversation Mm -hmm. of how we can finally end this thing for everybody's sake. Not just for the Israelis and the Palestinians, but for every human being on earth that's tired of seeing this type of violence back and forth between the two people. Amen. Yes, that. And I also think that the world leaders have to step up. I mean, they're not kids. They're 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 like really deal with it because it's not going to be. Yeah. Like really deal with it. Get into the nitty gritty, like really say, okay, guys, maybe some land has to be returned. I mean, like really deal with it once and for. And then if they all agree and then it happens again, then I would say, okay, it's fucking hunting. Like at that point, once this is over and if the world is serious about doing what's right for both. If they're they, serious, right. If they're and, serious, and, and, and they right. come to a table and they finally agree, like once and for all, and then you violate this shit, then all bets are off. Is how I think maybe there can be a light at the end of the tunnel. I hope. Because it's just, I don't think anybody can take it anymore. And it's just getting worse and worse. And it might spread Iran, this thing, that thing. Right. But for me, I think so many people just see one tile in the mosaic and to try to even begin to understand this you have to really stand far from the wall because there's so many moving pieces so many moving parts so many little conflicts and so many different agitators on both sides yeah i just i think i'm shocked in america (laughs) you're shocked to see how much people really hate jews where they're not even trying to see the both parts or both ends or the conflict or understand the war is not even about them. They shouldn't even be in the war. Like it's not their forte. And they're quick to really go against Jews. There's violence on Jewish campuses. I mean, I guess, you know, that's the point of what we're trying to make. So if it wasn't even about Israel and 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 Palestine, I feel like the Jews in general have a very hard time being liked and well accepted and just being considered part of the human race. And I'm still trying to understand why. I mean, I know from biblical times and the jealousy, but there's jealousy with every group of people, you know? I just feel like it's more than just land. I feel like it's more than just feeling oppressed and wrong. I feel like if if we gave them everything right now, they would still want us dead. And it's like, just because we exist. So how do we stop that hatred? How do we prevent further anti-Semitism, further hate? And why I'm shocked is because this is the country that's saying, we're here for transgender rights. We're here for the LGBTQ rights. We're here for black rights. We're here for Asian rights. We're here for every human race, every Middle Eastern. And then the Jews know. So how do we how do we stand by that as people, you know? And it is interesting here in American politics how it seems like, and most Jews are liberal. Yeah, a lot of Jews are liberal. Yeah, yeah exactly. it's like the overwhelming majority, and it feels like the left kind of turned on them. Yes. Yes, it does feel so it's like a, that. So it's a very just crazy time in politics the world um, now i don't want to say this because i've been left and i've been liberal but i'm neither you- just for the record i am a human being yeah who me, looks I'm at not- every single issue so for example my whole beef with the right you started half the fucking wars in the last 25 years they want to blame biden for how they they america left but who took us there it was the right right so for me there's no right or wrong here 
I try well, to look that, at, So that I agree with you about the war because every politician wants to look like the hero and do the dirty work and we don't I, know who's doing who. I look at me as someone that came out of underneath the World Trade Center. My heart was swollen. I saw those buildings crumble in front of my eyes, literally. I'm lucky the cloud didn't cover me because I probably would not be here today. Whoever breathed in that, I call it the death cloud, that tsunami when the buildings fell. And I remember my president at the time, George Bush Jr., telling, we're going to go out and take out the Taliban. And 20 fucking years later, trillions of dollars, friends and family served, lost their lives. My cousin fought in the Battle of Fallujah. He's a Marine. Shout out to Brian in Dallas. Lost half his fucking platoon. There was no weapons of mass destruction. So for me, it's like, as an American, I'm tired as much as I love whoever I love. And whatever. I just, I'm, I'm like, can we just, can we stop? fucking war tired of the fighting the war i'm tired of the war and and like i have my friend in flint michigan he doesn't even have clean water he's quadriplegic from the neck down and i'm behind and trying to help him because i'm having a hard time getting by myself these days with everything going on in life and he doesn't even have clean water to take a bath and he's paralyzed from the neck down an american but he's not the only one that lives in flint michigan i drove there to film a documentary and we have all this money for destruction and weapons so like there's like so much it's not just the conflict between you two, it's like American minds are like, what, another fucking war? Another this? Another that? It might spread. My, my son's 17. He might get drafted. If That's this what thing. I was going to say. It's, you see how it's affecting already now your kids that so, live here. You know, and as someone that lost family in war, and when I look backwards, nobody won. The Serbians didn't win. We didn't win. Even with our independence, because both of our peoples are still poor. Both of our people still hate each other. Both of our people are suffering and leaving their countries. And the war did nothing but destroy all of us. Yes, we have more freedom because of it. Thank God. And it was really bad under them for a while. But I'm trying to be someone that can build a bridge. But they call for our, our wiping out too. The Serbians, like a lot of them, want us off the map completely. And it is similar kind of to the Israel-Palestine thing. And that's our, you know where our country was born, you know, religiously, you know, Serbian Orthodox, our monasteries are there, and they have that claim, and Albanians say, well, we've been there since, because Slavs migrated in the 700s, we've been there since before, you know, BC, and and I'm sitting here going, what did we win? I lost my family. You had to maybe kill people, you have to live with that the rest of your life. Both of our countries are poor. Um, the majority of our youth can't wait to get the hell out of there. And it'll probably be the same thing in Israel. Even if you win, if there's always this constant threat of people doing stuff like this, you might get tired of living there too. More so like what I'm trying to say is nobody wins in the long run in these I conflicts. Understand. And I really do understand where you're coming from because I have the heart you do and the mind you do. And everything you said is beautifully articulated. I wish I could. I honestly, if I'm going to be real, hold on, sorry. I'm going to get you a real I- camera stand, man. I wish I could articulate. I, I, if I'm going to be real, I'm broke as hell. I, I need a new camera. No, I'm just kidding. But if I'm going to be real, I don't like war. I don't like fighting. I'm a person of love. I want everyone to get along. I wish, I wish we could all get along. I listen, and I'm, I'm crying physically every day because I'm like, who am I betraying? Every day I'm betraying somebody. I'm betraying my people. I'm betraying the Pals. You know, in a way, the Palestinians feel we're betraying them. You know. But like you said, to call everyone, like to stereotype and to put everyone in one group, like a group in one, you know, make one person a group. I don't, I don't agree with that. I think we all. And there are to- some Israelis that are against the response from maybe. Yes. The, so like, that's yes, what I'm trying to say. Like, this is what people need to understand. Like. Not every Israeli is like, yeah, let's. Let's uh, fucking level it and make it a parking lot. And. Oh, God forbid. They don't even. I mean, most Israelis are like, well, I mean, I can't even believe this. This happened. We didn't want this to get here. We didn't understand this. We we thought we were progressing. Listen, in, in, I know Israel in. I don't know the government inside and out. I don't live there. Do you go at all? You. I mean, do you visit? Yes. I, that, so that's another thing. So it affected me because it's it was like a, a place we went every summer and I go there and my p- parents have an apartment there. My grandparents, are, you know, they've passed away. May they rest in peace. But they uh have apartments like we've had we have family there still a lot of family and and i also had cousins that were affected and and injured or passed away because of this massacre so i know that there's truth in what's happening and and i keep saying like i don't we don't want this they israel has to protect israel not because just for the jewish people israel has to protect israel for everybody non-jews by the way that live there americans that live there 
I don't think they're also realizing this, you know, and also to the Palestinians that live in America that aren't having education. It's like, go to Gaza then if you really want to help. Because I don't think not one of them would go to Gaza and actually help, you know, to really see what the hell is going on but down then, there. Like, you know, really the truth. And people like us go like, okay, so why was our government about to give, for example, Iran a couple billion dollars? They're supposedly funding Hezbollah. Right. Like it, to us, it's like none of this shit makes sense at all. And we're, you know, as an American, as someone outside of those two nationalities, you know, these two ethnic groups that are also, they're also Semitic, by the way. I know you know that, right? Arabic, Hebrew, Semitic. Um, I seen that you were in uh, Newsweek last week. Yes. They yes. have you quoted here. Ish, um, the famous comedian, claims to be the most successful. Female. Amy Schumer. Amy Schumer. Is she a friend of yours in real life? She is friendly. I'm friendly to her. She's really been one of the most, uh, I could tell you she's been the nicest one to me in this comedy industry. As you know, comedy is not easy. It's tough. There's a lot of politics. It's very hard to maneuver as a comedian in the last 10 years. Very hard. Pretty, much, also, since, pretty much since the Me Too movement. I think that was the major shift. Yeah. Where you couldn't make fun of people no more. You couldn't make fun of women. You couldn't yeah. make fun of like different, which I got to admit, I, I, you know, th that's the stuff that made me laugh the most. I'm not going to lie. You can't be risque with like what's you know, going on. We'd make fun women. of Jewish people with stupid stereotypes, Muslim people. Ah, you know, we would, and it was, I found it to be hilarious because we're being a little comical and maybe distorting reality, you know, borderline racist, but it's like in a comedy club, fuck it. Everybody's open game. And as long as you're making fun of everyone else, then I'm not saying, because it's like basically the only way it's not racist when you're doing comedy is if you're going to make fun of every single person in that audience. I think that's how people got away with it for so long. But now, like, everyone's so sensitive, you can't really make because, those... Right. Ethnic, now everybody has a responsibility to... Because, sorry, you you can't make those ethnic jokes anymore. And, and I, I understand that aspect of it also because... Right, because it encourages a lot of danger. It like, does. If people weren't acting like this, violent, maybe we can. But if you're going to act so violently... It you does. Know, it does encourage it in ways because you make a joke with it, but some people take it for truth. And they think, oh, yeah. they're all like that. And they're going to blow you up. And they're going to this. Or that. So in this article, um, and I forgot the excerpt, but they have a great shot of you here. You're looking phenomenal here. Uh, it says um, Chanel Amari in 2017. So that was, uh, I can't even add anymore. I'm not good at math. Uh, Eight years ago. <laughs> I'm counting with no, my sorry. fingers. Six years ago. Six years ago. <laughs> I went finance degree. I couldn't add 2023 minus 2017. Six years ago, um, I think it says here, what did you write here? It, so she basically, she's she's got a lot of backlash right, for supporting Israel. It says here that she grew up, uh, it says the 42-year-old actress and comedian who was raised Jewish has divided fans with her pro-Israel statements, particularly in a viral message chain between Schumer and black Filipino actress Asia Johnson. I'm not even familiar with who she is. I know who Amy is because she's hilarious. Responding to the fallout on Instagram, Schumer called out social media users who have insulted her appearance and comedic skills, which that's not cool any day of the week to make fun of the way someone looks because that's something you can't control. God made you like that. So you're, I always felt, and I realized this older because I could be a little heartless when I was younger. If you are someone that claims to believe in God, any type of higher power, you believe that that creator, even if you're a Hindu, there's gods or whatever it is, the higher power created all of us. Mm -hmm. So if I make fun of someone the way they look, I'm making fun of the one that created them. That's why it's not okay to make fun of people. I agree. If you believe in God. You cannot believe in God and make fun of someone the way they look. That's the way God made them. That's why you can't hate another skin color. Because God, so for me to think that it's not okay for my children to marry a black person, I'm saying I'm smarter than God. No, no, God, you got it wrong. Yeah, you made us one human family, but no, 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 you're wrong. These two can't mix together. So you are defiling the essence of what it is to believe in God. Making fun of the way people look, making fun of their skin color, making fun of their ethnicity. God designed these. And I find all these cultures to be, the world would be so fucking boring. And where would we be without bagels? Thank you guys, by the way. Jews. See? Okay, that's, like, a, where, like, that's a cute joke. Like, that, where, but, 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 but could you imagine New York without bagels? Like, I'm not saying it to be even stereotypical. Like, no, you guys I know. invented. It's like one of my favorite fucking things on earth. 
and pastrami. No one does it better. See, maybe if we complimented one another more. So, or, you know, where would the world be without falafel and Almost. tahini? And so, like, you know, like, I love Arab food. So, so here it says that, you know, so she caught some, what I'm understanding. So forgive me to give me. So, so like, ever since this conflict started, it seems like they're hitting up her Instagram. They're hitting up her, her um, uh, X account or Twitter, whatever the hell it's called now. And um, I guess they, what are they, they reached out to you, Newsweek, for like a statement or what is this here? Yes. And by the way, just on that note, uh, Amy Schumer did advocate for innocent Palestinians as well and Arabs and Muslims and her brothers. She says, my brothers, my Arab brothers and sisters. But she did make a point that, see, if, she, if this wasn't a Jewish comic, it would be a very different tune. That's what my point of the message was in, in that article. If she wasn't a Jewish comic, would people second guess her success and 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 insult her like that i don't think so that's where it comes back to why people are like anti-semitism is spreading and sometimes you know we know it or we don't know it this is what it looks like a form of anti-semitism where no one wants to give her the accolades of the success she earned she is one of the most successful comedians on paper if you see it and it's also you know also what defines success you know this, this, I, don't, I don't think it's just money, in my opinion. No, not just money and not just awards and not just... Um, like some people, the, they have the debate yeah. whether Floyd Mayweather is the greatest of all time or Muhammad Ali. Even in my opinion, see, I think, I think it comes from the eye of the beholder. Even if Floyd Mayweather made tons more money, even if they took into consideration inflation, right, over the years... And even if he has more titles and never was defeated, when you study the life of Muhammad Ali, to me, he's the greatest that there ever will be because this is a man who was fighting racial inequality. He gave up his championship title and went to jail to not go serve in a war he didn't believe in. And he helped bridge the cap, bridge the gap between the Caucasian and, and African-American race in this country during the most volatile time of the civil rights era. And he made you feel stupid when he spoke with his intelligence and his charisma that he helped bridge a, a huge gap and destroy hatred. So to me, that's the champion of all time. His impact was felt, it'll be felt forever. He's a legend. He's beyond champion. He's a, he's a fucking legend, right? So yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like, you know, you could be the greatest without the money. Yeah. It's because well, my impact. point was because she... Right. So the, so similar to what you're echoing is that she's a great leader on and off stage. So she's not just funny on stage and makes you believe in her and her charisma, but off stage, she's an activist and she believes between, you know, good and evil and right and wrong and, you know, being a human activist. She believes in human rights. She believes in human equality. And I don't think she should be crucified or talked about her looks. A lot of times when you go for looks or your nationality or your religion, I consider that bullying and that's easy to bully and say, F you, you're ugly, you're this, you know, but where's the education? Where's the knowledge? Like, where's the respect for her? A, being a human, B, being a Jewish woman, C, being a very famous, successful comedian that's impacted people a lot and made them laugh and made them feel better when, you know, when the going went, you know, got tough. So, I mean, for me, I had to stand for her because I, I saw she was trying to do good and she wasn't, her intentions were good. And I, I believe she is one of the most successful comedians because that's someone I look up to, to want to, to me, that's success. You know, she I didn't done, even know she, she was Jewish. You didn't know? No. The, now I, I knew after this whole backlash, I never knew that she was Jewish. Yeah. She wasn't that vocal about it, which, because again, because we feel like we have to assimilate. Because and I'm going to quote you. I'm going to quote yeah. you on Newsweek. Yes. Okay. Oh, shit. I do believe Amy Schumer is one of the most successful comedians of our time, which is true. American actress and stand-up comedian Chanel Omari told Newsweek she has changed the game for comedy for female comedians, especially, and is just as genuine off stage as she is on stage. So let me ask you a question, because I'm not an expert in the comedy world. What did she do that changed the game for female comedians? Because one of my favorite is, what's her name? She's so foul mouth. She's hilarious, though. She's always at the roast. That Lampanelli, or what's her oh, name? Oh, not Sarah Silverman. No, no, L Lampanelli. I think. L oh, Lamp Lisa Lampanelli. <sighs> oh, fuck it. She's hilarious. She's so nasty with that mouth. But I, I mean, that's what I, I, you know, 
they always tell me that the best comics are the ones that don't have to use dirty language. Mm -hmm. That's what like, you I know, don't agree. Necessary. Well, that's why I think Amy Schumer was like I a like, fresh there. I, I like that filthy shit, bro. I think it's hilarious. Right, but, a lot of people don't. So what did Amy do that you feel impacted comedy for all females? Educate me because I'm ignorant. For me, I think she showed that women can be like men. We can be equal. So a woman of, of her stature can still make women and men, both genders, laugh and relate to her art, relate to what she was going through. I think she was one of the most, the, the reason I looked up to her, oh, this camera, it's not on my side today. The reason I looked up to her was because she wasn't afraid to go anywhere with her material, with whatever she was feeling. She could talk about her period, which most people didn't want to hear about at the time. You know, she helped female comics progress about and talk about birth control, plan B, topics we didn't really feel comfortable talking sex. about. Sex. Sex. Giving, you know, the BJs and the D and all that. that Basically, I know. reality. Reality that, that's taboo in a Middle Eastern home. You know, you can't be talking about, in a Jewish home, you can't be talking about you that. You talk like that in Albania home. Even I mean, now. it's over. Yeah, it's over. So I think she gave us the freedom, like, oh. And she wasn't a, a size zero. She wasn't a size two. She was plus size, but voluptuous and open and embraced her body. So she helped female comics also remember that this is not a modeling contest. God bless all the young, uh, you know, hot female comics that are in it today. It's not about a hot being a model or pretty or not. It's about the game, being funny and talking and storytelling, telling she would be able to just say the jokes and tell how she felt and people can relate to her and, and really resonate with her, you know, she, and she wasn't fake about it. You know, whatever you saw on stage, what you see is what you got off stage. It's very hard for a lot of comics. Comics are very fake. I love you guys and, sh you know, but I'm going to be real. A lot of comedians will have their same jokes they say over and for over. Years. And over. For I didn't years. Real I didn't realize until I kind of started, started dabbling into the comic world. Shout out to my man Tehran. Extremely talented. He's also very similar like you. Jewish and Muslim background. He's love black. That. He's African American. Love it. Like he's mixed and he's so fucking brilliant. He's his fucking delivery. He talks about things with the politics, which is like the most dangerous thing you can do as a comedian. Right. But in such a way that he's just, honestly, I think he's, he's phenomenal. You got to check this guy out. And uh, he hosts uh, Tehran Thursdays at the Laugh Factory on Sunset in LA. Oh, nice. And uh, he goes on tour a lot with Maj Boni, who also has a very funny way of kind of picking on the Middle Eastern. And, you know, he's of Persian descent. And he took me to a protest for what was happening earlier last year when the woman was killed for not wearing a headscarf in Iran. And it almost led to a revolution back there. And I was in, uh, I believe it was Washington Square Park. And, uh, you know, he, he made fun of me that night on the show. He was like, because I'm always wearing black. I got a beard. He's like... I'm there protesting the regime and this guy standing behind me and he looks like the regime. I was fucking dying because everyone looked at me. I look like, you know, like the beard. And, but what I'm saying is uh, it is not easy to be a comic in today's world. You cannot get away with right. what you guys used to get away with. So I guess what you're telling me is that Amy took down a lot of boundaries or taboo right. topics for female entertainers to talk about and feel more comfortable and she's a pioneer in that aspect yeah and even till today till this day like you know it's not the popular opinion that she's talking about pro-israel or pro again you can be pro-israel and pro-jewish people and not want to be a murderer or be considered a murderer just like a pro-palestinian shouldn't be considered a terrorist but however if they don't stop it from now because it feels like they're chanting terrorism when they're pro-hamas and stuff like that but she's been my point is is like she doesn't my advice also to all comics, and they've debated me, you know, comics would get mad at me for doing crowd work. I started doing crowd work and I said, fuck you, I'm doing crowd work, excuse my language. That's how I process. I opened up for Cedric the Entertainer, I've opened up for George Lopez, the greats. And their advice to me was, it's not about joke, punch, joke. It's about storytelling within your jokes. You know, sometimes I hear these people and they're talking about a mouse in their apartment. No one cares and I don't find it funny. What's funny? You know who's amazing? Who's amazing and crowd work i think the best i've ever fucking seen in my life mm -hmm. leslie jones 
Oh, she's amazing. By the way, I that's all she fucking does. That's she I literally. Just for her, then it, that's all she and she's amazing. She literally yeah. will grab that mic, and the whole thing, and like imagine the brilliance you got to be, because it's never this. Every time I see, it, it's not the same. No, she's flown through that crowd, and the whole show that's was just. Talent. That's extremely difficult to do. She's walking through that crowd, making fun of everyone. No one's getting offended. Everyone's not crying. Everyone's crying every time she grabs that mic. So to do crowd work as a comedian is, it can be, I've seen it where it can backfire. Right. Where the person gets offended and next thing you know, you've seen videos online, there's a fight and they throw a glass at the comedian and fucking all hell can break loose. So it's, it's not feel like, you know, as a Muslim, we feel kind of left out because you guys have like all these songs, you know, Adam Sandler gave you the Hanukkah song. You know, it's time for Hanukkah. By the way, a legend. What of, is a Muslim song that, well, there's I, a I, I made one. I, I, I made one. I'm going to make one. I'm going to make um. us our own. How they have like a Christmas carol. They have the Hanukkah song. I'm going to make the Ramadan song. You ready? Do it. I'm on with the, you. On the first night of Ramadan, my true love gave to me nothing to eat, nothing to drink, nothing to taste. Because we were fasting. We can't even make a song. I love that. I love it. But you have a classic Arabic song that I love, that we love to dance, both Israelis and Arabs, is Habibi Ha'ani. You're talking about uh, uh, Amir Diab. Amir, I think it's Amir Diab. Uh, yeah, it is, and it's been a, a <sighs> huge song that I was raised. It's a, it's classic. How do it's we a- bring you cousins? And it, it's pain when you say that, right? Because like so close, so painful. One says shalom, one says salam. Both are snipped down below the waist. Both don't eat pork unless they're a Christian Palestinian, which they're also a part of that community. You're in a holy place in the world, and to see the carnage is just, how do we get you guys? What the, I mean, like I said, I don't think, (laughs) I think kind of what we said earlier, but, you know, what would you want to say to someone who feels like, well, I don't agree with Amy. I think she's not seeing the side of the Palestinians. She doesn't see the excessive force. Some places that were sensitive areas, hospitals, this, that. What would you say to that person? Do you think that they feel that she's being biased? Uh, I would say she's not being biased, but yes, she has a duty, like we talked about, because this war has... Provoked- and everybody defends their own, so we got to be real there. Right. They provoke their... This war has provoked further anti-Semitism. So I do stand with Amy in this situation where she has a duty, a, resp- a moral responsibility that she knows the education of her Jewish people. She knows the education of Israel. She knows the education of the other side. We all might not have super details, but not, neither do the Palestinian Americans here or, or Arabs or anybody. We all and, think- And we're, the hate crimes are both For the white Americans, by the way, that set the 20 year olds that I'm scared for our youth because the hate that they have, I don't know what's going on at home, but it's bigger than the war. I can tell you that psychologically. You're not hating a Jew or a Muslim when you're a white American because you have facts you don't and when you're 20 years old and you can't even you're not even legal to drink you don't even have the capacity as a brain your your brain doesn't even form fully till you're 25 you don't have the facts let's be real and then they want to be like the 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 end all be all of i also um, feel like unless you've even been to a place to even see it correct they haven't you they can't haven't assess any- but you know then people say well we have all these videos we can see this we have footage we have i mean i still feel like if you really want to assess something you need to go on the ground. Yes, I agree with that. And, and that's do, you why I feel, do you feel if someone who is not one way or the other, 100% neutral, do you think that if they visited Israel, that they mm-hmm. would f- side with Israel 100%? I think they would feel differently about the narrative of who Israel is and what we are and what we stand for and who the Jewish people are. I do think we would feel differently. It's kind of like a bully in school. All of a sudden, the bully, the popular guy, he's telling you, that kid smells, that kid's gross, that kid's this, that kid did this to me. Meanwhile, it's a kid with a backpack with glasses who can barely hurt a fly. I'm not I'm not victimizing anybody either because Israel's, you know, we, Jewish people, like Israelis, like they, they like to think of them as strong, right? But what I'm saying is the narrative is not all true. If they just were a little open-minded, if our Arab brothers and sisters were more open-minded with us, and we're open-minded with them, and we can come together and fight against terrorism and say, we're not going to stand for anybody on any side being violent or extremists or randomly call a war that we weren't ready for or 
or rape and murder children or bomb or this. None of that. We should be against violence, kind of like we're against someone randomly shooting up a school. We're not for that or for our kids. So that, that's what I would like to say, to be open-minded more about the Jewish people, learn the Jewish history, learn the Arab history, learn both, both people have been oppressed and have compassion for these people and understand that we're not the army. We don't know the ins and outs of what America is doing right now and the politicians there and the leaders of Iran and the leaders of Israel or the leaders of Hamas. But what I do know is that something has to change and that can't be violence. We can't continue our world and bring children into this world with violence and anti-Semitism or racism or bigotry or, you know, violence, terrorism. And that does not include all the Palestinian people or all the Israeli people or all the Arab people or, or all the Muslim people. You know, I just that's what I want. I want a less hateful country. You know, I want a less hateful world. That's what I think it comes down to. You know, us really accepting each other for who we are and what we are, regardless of, about race, ethnicity, religion, culture, how we look. You know, you know how many times I've been discriminated just because I'm not the prettiest in the world? Can I help that? Can I really help that? Do I have to slip my, th my wrist every day because half the world doesn't think I'm the aesthetic of pretty, I mean, that's ridiculous. You know, it's like, it's like how evil can you have to, that you have to be that you, you know? So what I'm, I'm I just want a better world. It, it not, I want a better world for Israel and for Jewish people. I want a better world for Arabs. And, but I don't have the tolerance for terrorism in any situation or extremism or somebody who's going to use their fists and curse somebody out before having a conversation like you and I are having a conversation and talking and you're very articulate and you're brilliant and you have history knowledge and you know, you know, hey, what are we going to do to change? You know, and I, and I don't think it's one conversation. I think it's going to continue. I think it's going to continue. I think we're going to have to share and we're going to have to acknowledge and educate, you know. But I do feel if Amy Schumer wasn't Amy Schumer and she wasn't going through the Jewish thing, I do think we would be singing a different tune. That's sad. Do you think that if she still supported Israel without being Jewish, the backlash would have been less? That's a great question. It is I, a great question. It's a great question. I just thought of it. It's, it's a, I think she would still get attacked um, from the people that don't agree. But the question is, would it be worse? If she was pro-Palestine? No, if she was same stance, but just not Jewish. And, well, so I have we have I have a friend that's not. Do you think Jewish the comments people. would have been as nasty? You think they would have took the perspective of like, "Hey, you're not Jewish, so you don't understand what they're doing to us," or do you think they would still just be as vicious as they were to her? I don't know. I guess it's a hypothetical. I think I think the extremists would be just as vicious. The extremists, the people who don't have the knowledge, that don't understand, that don't have the compassion, because even if she's Jewish or not. She was trying to say, I don't stand for terrorism. I don't stand for any innocent casualties being. I had, I had a Serbian follower. If he's watching, he watches my work. So shout out. There was a protest because we had a, a skirmish in Kosovo. The Serbian had, they call terrorists, cross over the border and uh, kill a uh, police officer. And then they went to uh, the monastery to hide and then they got arrested or whatever, whatever. It, but, like, very tense situation there. And he was like, I want to come to the protest, my people, against his own people. And I said, well, why? He's like, because you didn't group us with our government. You said our government and not the people. And maybe the Israeli government is being excessive even by standards of Israelis that are living there. But there's also a, a perspective that I had an epiphany from what happened to my people and my family. There was state-controlled media in Yugoslavia. It was called B92, and it was only what the state would approve and blah, blah, blah. So That's a great point when, to bring when, up. When I, when I put myself, it's very hard to take yourself out of your own body mm -hmm. and go into their side because if you can't do that, you're never going to have peace, not you or the Palestinians. Oh, I agree. And I try. I put myself. I even and, said... And, and the truth of the matter is one's going to have to be even more gracious than the other for it to ever be peace. Even if they're getting the short end of the stick one way or the other, if the world can beat out a solution here between the two once and for all, um, I think the most fair solution would have been after that first final big break where the state was created and they were wherever they ended up going, which again might not have been 
acceptable to them. I could understand why they might feel that way. Would have been, okay, here's their state, we're giving you one, and maybe the religious sites would have been left neutral under the care of the UN at that time, but we're past that point too. So, But for me, it was realizing that, hey, these people were told that we're terrorists, and that's what we were called in the beginning. Even the American government originally classified, even my own family, as terrorists until they realized what was happening again. Then they recognized the Kosovo Liberation Army uh, as basically farmers defending themselves against a regime that had already massacred 500,000 Bosnians. Like, they already knew which way it was going to go again, which is why America got involved and decided to stop it with a bombing campaign that, you know, resulted in Milosevic withdrawing his forces. And where I think a lot of us are upset is we say, well, there's this building in 42nd Street. It's called the United Nations. All these countries come together. But America vetoes against a ceasefire. That has nothing to even do with Israel. Like, that's not Israel's call there. But America has the veto power. So as Americans, we're like, we're seeing this carnage. We understand Israel wants to go in and root out the terrorists. But at the same time, we're like, zero-sum game. Maybe too many civilians are dying. We want this to stop right away and try to maybe mediate a diplomatic solution, which might be in the best interest of Israel too right now at this point, because I feel like a lot of the public is coming out against them and it seems to be growing the support for them to stop whatever the, it seems like that. I mean, you look at the videos of the protests in London. And so I think some people get angry. They're like, well, why can't, why would our government veto a cease power? You know? So like there's all these things that add more and more layers of, animosity in my opinion to the situation i agree i agree and 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 this is where i get back to the whole propaganda thing for me taking myself out of my shoes as an albanian who lost his family who hated anyone that was from that region until i understood how to evolve as a human being and not judge them all at once and realize that they were under state-controlled media for decades of course they're going to think we're all animals and terrorists and maybe that also happens over there, of course, they're going to be more biased towards their their side of it, where maybe if the average Israeli actually went in there and got to live a little bit how the Palestinians live, maybe they would. What I'm saying is I feel there's a significant lack of empathy and compassion on both sides in many different ways, that if there's some way they could figure out to do what I had to do to try to find a way to bridge, because I don't want another war where my family comes from. These last 20 years have been great. I don't have a problem with Serbians coming back and feeling safe to visit their holy sites and all that stuff. And I just, but they don't even recognize our right to exist, the overwhelming majority of them. So there are some parallels between what's going on in Israel and Gaza and my people and the Serbians and, and, and ethnic tension and religious claims to the land which is what they have they say we have a religious claim to this land and it's like me that all the people that died i'm sitting here going man like who cares like it's fucking like it's these imaginary lines man like we zoom out far enough into space like none of this shit really matters right you know and i do i think it's right survival mode i think we're all in excuse me, through generational trauma and our own oppression for each, everybody has that. And I think that's, yeah, we're, we're coming from, instead of compassion, we're coming from survival mode, some of us, or, or, or which can be, can be aggressive at times because you're, you're, you know, you you just got hit hard. I mean, listen, 1400 people is not small. Right. I just wish the world had more compassion. 1400 people to lose in in a day. It's a lot of fucking people. A lot of people. But on the other side, also, a lot of and civilians. by the way, not only Jewish or Israeli people. Again, some Arabs were. I saw the video of that one out. guy. They were kicking him on the floor and telling him to take us. I don't know whether they were trying to tell him to take him. And you could see the terror in his eyes. I guess they looked at him like as a collaborator because he's a citizen of Israel. And what I saw that one video. But I guess my question is, if this was happening to a black person, if this was happening to an Arab person, even though Arabs feel that it's happening to them, right? With the, but I'm saying, like, uh, just put them in the Israeli situation, the Jewish people, Asian. Why is everyone so willing to march for them and not us? That's just the rhetorical question I have. Maybe you can answer that from an outsider. Like, what you would, because you have more history and knowledge than most. Like, what is it? 
I think that if, if I'm being why why group all of us as, together? Yeah, yeah, be honest because the honesty. Is I the feel most like important. I think the, the the tide that we're seeing right now is they feel like well we understand what happened to you guys in World War Two, but there was less of you there regardless of your ancestral claims. Okay, this is kind of what I'm just saying. What they kind yeah, of yeah, what you're seeing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to know. And I they feel know. like okay, now you guys showed up, and yes, Britain gave it to you guys. You know the creation of the state, which is true, the Balfour Act and all that. We, we, I mean, it's it's all there. So they did get displaced, and then they're like, "That's what." Let, so basically, they say like, "Well, you're the reason this all started." Me as an outsider that's trying to be as fair as possible, it's also like, "Well, where the fuck are they supposed to go?" And yes, that's not the Palestinians' fault. So that's why I say the world unleashed two desperate people onto themselves. And didn't meet out a solution that was fair to the other side. And then you guys are stuck dealing with it now. And that's kind of. I also think it's a bigger picture. Like you and I know it's a deeper rooted that people don't want to take the time to understand or just don't even have the capacity to understand, which I can't blame them or make be mad at them know, for either. You know, it's like, um, you know, what the fuck do you do if you're Jewish World War II? Hot? And then they, they would say, well, then you should just live there and be. On. So then, but then you're like, okay, 75 years has gone by. What do you do? And how do you protect both peoples? You know? So it's just like such a, it's just such a fucking heartbreaking story. The whole history of it and how it ended up happening the way it did and the way things went down. And and everyone's just, I don't know. And again, like I said, there's people with various opinions on this of where it should start, where it should stop. Where does it, does it start 5,000 years ago? Does it start 75 years ago? Does it start October 7th? What led to what? Tit for tat, back and forth. And even though, yes, they are Arab, Arabs are clans, and like their clans are basically like nations. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are the same. They have different dialects, different traditions based on clans. Um, Albanians are clan people too, but we are, it seems a little bit more united. And during the Kosovo War, if Albania didn't open its borders to allow us in, and I told this to the Palestinians too, like, how does Egypt not let you, like, okay, cool, you guys right, want, like, to like, 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 like the men, you want to stay and fight and you right. don't want to surrender the land and I can respect that as a man, as someone standing up for his last piece of land he has left in his possession or whatever. I mm -hmm. understand that. But I also understand that if everyone dies, there's no one for the next generation to exist, period. So like, how do you not open the border for them, for the women and children to get out? If Albania didn't open the border for us and Macedonia that because of American pressure, because there was a big concentration camp and they were like not the best conditions. They weren't like killing us like in the World War II camp, but it was too many people, not enough food, water. And I think that's another thing that made people upset. They were like, well, how do you justify shutting off the water, the power, all this shit when, yes, there's, they're looking at us collective punishment. I think is the general concern. I, I, I see it. I see it. And, and, that, I, and that's and why me, I think that's where the rate, like, this is where I feel like. I still feel though it's kind of a little bit of a bullying situation. It's a lot I of just wish, I just wish me personally, I think if they would have shown some restraint right now, and I know how hard that is because your heart's swollen. You just had, it's like you just get punched in the face full force and you don't do nothing about it. Thank you. That's if, a great if, if, That's if, what I'm trying to say. If you're a man, but. It could be like you punch me in the face, but then I break your back. I kind of went so like I feel like that's the feeling that the public has, whether it's inspired through social media, seeing the pictures, videos, whatever it is. I feel people feel like, yes, Israel, you were punched in the face, but right now, you're like breaking their back where they can never walk again, basically. Which, do two wrongs make a right? That's another question. Do like if you saw me get punched in school and you knew I didn't start it, and you see two bullies doing it to me, and you tell me, Chanel, how did you not defend yourself? And you tell me, don't physically fight them back. That's not the answer. Go to the teacher, go to the principal, let them figure it out. And it's still not figure it out. Then what do we do? But the principal didn't fucking. They do don't it. want peace. If the kids don't want peace because they're just jealous, they don't want to admit they're jealous. They're just like, ah, it's this, it's this and this. And the teacher's like, okay, I got it. But when are we going to, when are we going to, you know. And we're back. <laughs> and we're back to square one. Yeah, it's that. <laughs> right. It's like, and that's what God said. I'm giving you this Bible. You are, this is the biggest punishment. You know, because we came from, um, I could be wrong, but it's Yitzhak and Yaakov. 
right? That's how uh, Ishmael and 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 you had Abraham. He had two sons, Isaac and, and Ishmael. Right. One became the Israelites. One became the nation of the Arabs. So that's already from that time. Meaning, how are and we going to control? You have so much in common. It's so much, but also two brothers insane. that are dying for the attention of their father, which I can relate. The only difference between a Muslim and a Jew, religiously, uh, actually, Muslims and Jews have way more in common as far as actual doctrine. The only difference is that um, Judaism doesn't have Jesus and Muhammad. And John the Baptist. Right. And Christians and Muslims have all of them, but the way they look at Jesus is different than the way Christians do. Christians believe he is God or the son of God. Muslims say, no, he was the Messiah. Jews say, no, he wasn't he was the a Messiah. Prophet. Yeah, he was, yeah, he was just a prophet. A Yahushua. Like, we believe that he was still a prophet. It depends. It depends. But Oh, it depends it, who you ask. But in right. essence, in any way, the doctrine, the core doctrine, of all three of those religions is exactly the same. And one of the most beautiful quotes in all three religions, it's in the Quran. I know it's in the Bible. To save one life is to, as if you saved all of humanity. To take one life is as if you killed all of humanity. So I think people need to put their hand on their heart. The Israeli, the Palestinian, somehow try to forget the last 75 years, which is hard because both sides have pain there. Some right. more than others. The audience can determine who they think that is. Right. But they need to look into the mirror and say, how did we start? Where are we now? Where were we? How do we put the hand on the heart and look from the other side and as hard as it is at your perceived enemy? And I went through that process and it was very difficult to do. And I found a way to kind of understand why what happened, even though it's not justifiable. How it could have happened, why it happened, and why it's not all Serbians' faults or all Palestinian or all Israel. And when we use that type of brush, that's where things get dangerous for everybody. And um, I want to thank you for coming. And first of all, why you deserve credit, regardless if people agree with what you're saying or not. It is very difficult to just be public just to begin with even if you're not talking about anything this serious. And to speak based on your perspective, what you think, right, wrong, whatever it is, that takes courage and that takes Thank bravery. And you will receive backlash. I will too. I get trolled left and right on my my uh, stuff. And, you know, I've actually come to enjoy it, to be honest. I actually look forward to the trolling. Are you sure it's not your ex-wife and my ex-boyfriend just... Buying bots? No. no <laughs> now but, I made a joke. Now I made a joke, bro. But, you know, okay, what, what... In all seriousness, sorry. What, you know, what I, I hope people respect from this episode is that whether they agree with your stance or not, having the courage to talk and voice your opinion, you know, for that you deserve a lot of credit. Because a lot of... There's plenty of Jewish American comedians. Yeah. You're right. And there's plenty of Arab American comedians and, you know, maybe they're like, you know, and I'm, I'm going to roast them a little bit. You know, a lot of people are giving DJ Khaled a, 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 a hard time right now. Are they? Well, he's of Palestinian descent. He's not said a single statement about it. And I'm sorry, like for me personally, if like that's your people and you can't even make one comment, like anything, unless he's posted recently, he has like nothing, not even sorry for this or this is excessive or nothing. Like, he doesn't have to even say, like, oh, you know, anything bad about Israel. We could just say, like, this is excessive. Or I mean, he's made nothing. And his people have roasted him for it. So what I'm trying to say is you have more courage. Than Silence, you. right, isn't the answer. You got I more courage than Zizek Khaled. I'll tell you that. Right, right. Well, that's, and I met him actually in real life and his wife and their love. I met him too. I was at the MTV, MTV Music Awards. He walked right past me. But he's been Neatest getting person in the world always shakes your hand doesn't he's matter if you're great and like is like so he's getting roasted by his people by Muslim like they're like how can you not say anything so that's an example of like just how difficult it could be but yeah it's when you're some processing it too when you're of a certain ethnicity and your people are involved in a conflict overseas you're like fuck i live in america like i say one wrong wrong one wrong thing here my fucking career could be over yeah. So that's what I'm trying to say. Like, I give you kudos 
Thank you. For talking about something that's very difficult. Whether I agree or don't, doesn't matter. What people think, doesn't matter. Because you are putting yourself out there to be roasted or roasted in real life. Like, not even comically, because that's fun, actually. And Lisa Lampanelli is the queen of that. But, yeah, I'm actually doing a roast this Thursday, and that must, that's not anything compared to what we're going. Right. Like, I want to cry because. Where's I this roast? I'm roasting um, at New York Comedy Club. James Pontillo, shout out to him. He's been also great, you know, giving me a chance. And um, I should come see you. He's Italian. Please, I would love. Oh my god, I would love for am you. I, am I gonna get past the road? I don't know. You're gonna, you're gonna. People are gonna be scared of you. They're gonna be like, "Yo, why don't you roast her?" We should actually work on that. But like in the future, maybe we could roast. You. See, I would. I always say roast someone you feel comfortable with that you know. So I've always picked opponents that I either knew or I I know I, I'm comfortable with or other you know background. Like my first opponent was Middle Eastern. He was of Palestinian and Arab descent. And we knew, though, that about each other. So we knew where we can go. And the that must have been a hilarious exchange. Of course, but especially. But that's the thing is like now it's a little too touchy. <clears throat> so the thing is, is my, my the point back to like being roasted and the roast and and, you know, it's a serious situation. But I do think that we have to have more conversations like this. It has to be more conversation, not yelling, not screaming, not I'm right or you're wrong or. It's like what you said, we have to all come together and and be human. I think what I'm seeing is that it's hurting me that like a lot of people are just not being human about things. It's like they're picking and choosing about what to be human about. And I think that's where my heart breaks, you know? And that's where the frustration comes from the Jewish people. And I think as Jewish people in general, everyone's like, oh, you never share your resources or their money, all this, again, narratives that aren't always true. We bound together because look at history. We have no choice but to bound together when we feel the whole world against against us but also like you said it's not really the whole world being against us it's like we're grouping everyone together because of what's happening you know what i mean so we we just have to be a little bit more loving compassionate understand each other you know because i'm praying for a better world i don't want my people to get killed i don't want us as a jewish nation to get exterminated and 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 succumb to hamas i i don't believe in hamas and i don't think that they're i i think they're like um, ISIS and I think they're like every, Jihad and every single extreme terrorist organization that doesn't care about their own people. They say it. They've been ca caught saying it, which frustrates me more for the peop for their people that they're getting caught saying, I don't give a shit about them. I don't care about their lives. They're here to work for us and enslave us. And it's like, who are you? You're not God. So you shouldn't even be, you know, that I wouldn't blame their people for being so frustrated with them and then blaming somebody else. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying that nobody not you know everybody has a foot in the door everybody has everybody has gotten themselves dirty no one's clean is my point you know and so we're definitely we, not as as americans i mean our history has as a americans, very, very dark a very dark you know start if you really analyze it and so it's just one of those very difficult um things in life in any event mm -hmm. i want the next time we're together it's going to be a straight comedy I hope this thing will yeah. be over and peace in the Middle East and prayers to all people and innocent life Amen. lost. And I'm praying for a ceasefire as soon as possible. And Amen. I want to thank you for, for making the time. And if you give me tickets to the roast, I will come. And uh, let's talk offline about some of the cool stuff we're going to do. Yes. And this is uh, Chanel Omari, friends. Check out her podcast. Google her. Try to understand from her perspective give her some grace and uh if we all just did that the world would be a much better place this is beck lover and you're watching the beck lover podcast where i hope you learned a thing or two about life to the next time chanel say goodbye to the people i love you guys beck lover i love that name first and foremost i'm sending love to you to the albanian people to the arab people to my israeli people to the jewish people to every people and i hope we find a happy medium, all of us, and we can progress as a human race and really accept one another unconditionally moving forward. And I'm praying for everybody. I'm praying for Israel. I'm praying for the innocent Palestinians, you know, that feel stuck, that feel alone, that feel helpless. I'm, I'm, I'm praying for life, not for death. I'm praying for life and for, and I'm, I'm, I love you and I'm sending you love and I'm, I'm, I'm honored that I have 
an opportunity to come on your amazing podcast and talk about this and be educated or educate others and and have a conversation because that's what it's about, you know? Less hate, more love, you know, less talking shit, more education, you know, and also understanding where, you know, one each other is coming from. Till the next time, my friend. Chanel Omari in the house. We'll see you. Bye. Next lovers.